Hello race fans, my name's Graham Brown and over the next few weeks and months we're going to be bringing you an insight into the world of national hot rod racing about the drivers, we're going to talk to the drivers about their cars, we're going to show you the cars and we're going to show you the racing and we're going to start off by having a look at the cars that are involved, what goes into the cars and also the kind of tracks they race on and how the racing is actually conducted. We hope you're going to enjoy it. So Matt, um, thank you very much indeed for showing us your racing car and taking time out of your busy day to do that very thing. Um, so this is in fact a Vauxhall Tigra A type, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, it's, a, it's not obviously the same as what it is on a road car. It's the, uh, the elevation is the same as a road car, but the body kit is obviously built out in the arches. So that's why we've got the big arches to obviously cover the wheels because we've got a maximum width that we can go with the suspension. So, which I, th I believe is 73 inches, I think it was a 72 inches. Now, these cars, so the original Tigres, are often thought of as being like hairdressers' cars, but obviously not this one. I'm not a hairdresser by no man's feet, but um, but yeah, they, they seem to be the car to have. Uh, I know there's a Mercedes SLK, there's a Peugeot 206 CCs, and some other cars out there, but the, the main car does seem to be the Tigra. Now, was any part of this car ever actually a real road going Vauxhall Tigra? No, uh, the, obviously there was a Tigra, the road car was taken off the road and the moulds were taken originally off the original car, but you know, the rear boot lid looks like the original Tigra off the car. Um, but that's about it really, everything is made and moulded to suit. Yeah, you, you say about moulds, this is for making the body shell obviously. That's correct, yeah, it's a Ludlow Motorsport kit, uh, which they obviously designed the first one and now the majority of the field have got them. <laughs> this rear wing that uh, we're standing next to here, um, does this actually have a purpose or uh, is it just purely cosmetic? Um, years ago it was, we all thought it was for looks, but I definitely think you know the wings do make a difference. Uh, you know, look at modern day F1 cars, they're changing their wings week in, week out. So I think we do go fast enough for wings, um, but everyone's got their own opinions on that. But I personally do, I think they do make a difference, yeah. You think it generates a little bit of extra downforce? Yeah, I mean, you've obviously got the added effect of drag as well. So you obviously don't want to be slowing yourself up. So it's, it's the case of minimum drag, maximum downforce. These tyres, obviously they're racing tyres, um, fairly wide, but uh, they seem to be completely bald. Now I realise that there are a lot of hot rod fans who will know the answers to all of this, but since we have to have tread on our road going cars, why, why have you got bald tyres? Why would they be considered to be better? Uh, our racing tyres, they're 10 inches wide um, and they're a racing slick, so a slightly softer compound than you would in your road going tyres. Uh, the smooth is obviously because the track's smooth and the rubbers, the, the tyre is smooth, it just adheres better to the track so you get a lot better, you know, a lot better grip. And what about when it rains? We've got treaded tyres with obviously like your road tyres but again they're 10 inch wide with grooves cut in the, in the, in the wet so they obviously get rid of the water a lot easier. And uh, the wheels, these presumably are not very heavy. Everything on this car is designed to be as light as possible, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, the wheels, they're, all, they're split rim wheels, which mean you've got an outer, a centre and an inner. So if you damage the outer, you can replace the outer. So they're what you call a three-piece wheel. But very light also. Yeah, but not very strong either on the, on the other hand either. So, yeah, they're supplied by image wheels. OK, Matt, I wonder if you wouldn't mind showing us uh, underneath the bonnet and what actually motivates this machine of yours now. Yeah, no problem. With the uh, with the bonnet removed, we can see we can see the engine. It's clearly got Vauxhall in great big letters on the top of it. What what did this start out life as, Matt? Uh, they were in the Vauxhall Astra uh, and the Vauxhall Cavalier, the similar engine that was in the the, the BTCC Cavalier with John Cleland back in the 90s. Uh, that was where the engine became really famous. And um, can you describe the actual layout of the engine? It's 16 valves for a start, isn't it? It's a 2 litre 16 valve overhead cam on twin 45 Weber carburettors. Uh, there's a maximum lift. And you, you're looking at around sort of two, 240 brake horsepower with around 180 to 190 foot pounds of torque. Yeah, now you mentioned carburettors. Now these engines are not originally designed to run carburettors. In fact, they are designed to be injected. And um, there are people that would say they were in fact quite crude. Um, why is that? 
Um, we, we've have been carburettors since you know the engine was introduced into hot rods, which my dad Jeff uh, brought in the formula. Oh, going back, must be 10, 15 years now. Um, and you know it's on an electric management box instead of the coil uh, that was used standard. And you know they were real good, reliable engine. And um, I don't suppose I need to ask you about the exhaust on this car now, do I, since you make your own? No, that's obviously one of ours. It's black because um, we have, we've had it ceramic coated, which obviously would just reduces the, the temperature, under bonnet temperature, because uh, as you can imagine, after 30, 40 or even 75 laps in a world final, the, the heat under the bonnet is absolutely phenomenal. So trying to get rid of the, as much heat as we can is a real good bonus. It does seem to be a fair bit of pipery underneath here. Um, what, what is this object here on the right-hand side at the front of the engine here? That's the, uh, that's the dry sump pump. Uh, in standard form, a road car has got his wet sump um, with a big sump baffled in the bottom. Um, but our sump is a, a thinner sump, which means you can get the engine lower um, and the oil pump gives you instant oil pressure where you know the oil is kept in a dry sump tank which is over the over the back there so the oil is stored in there and the, the pump pumps the oil around the system so there's no oil in the sump at all and obviously on a track where you're persistently turning right you don't want the oil to spend all its time halfway up the left hand side of the block no i mean a few people do still run wet sump you know which they you know if, if, if they're baffled correctly you shouldn't have any problems but when I like to turn my engine over, I like to see the oil pressure gauge moving before it even fires up. So just a matter of preference, really. And uh, what sort of uh, RPMs do you pull with this engine normally, Matt? The rev limiter is, uh, is set by 8,000 RPM. We've got an, an electron ignition box, um, which has got the map fixed. Um, so you can't advance the timing and stuff like that. But that is fixed to 8,000. So when we get to 8,000, the engine basically dies. It, it just will not gain any more speed whatsoever. And what about the amount of horsepower available at that point? Um, maximum power depending on, you know, cams, cam timing and, you know, exhaust lengths as well. Changing the exhaust length can make a big difference on power. So it depends where you want maximum power and torque to be. You could have it so it runs at 8,000, but, you know, some engines die off at 7.2. It depends where you want the torque and power to be. Yeah, but if, if you were going for maximum brake horsepower, what would you get? Um, you'd probably get, out of this particular engine, you'd be 240 as it would be a good engine but obviously you might prefer torque I mean there's an old saying isn't there about brake horsepower figures sell engines but torque wins races yeah that's exactly right it's it's a matter of just preference really I mean it's just trying to get the best of both you know you want you need to you need the horsepower but you need the torque it's just getting that fine balance and obviously the fine balance wins races tell us something about the weight of the car because obviously you can have lots of horsepower but the weight of the car matters a lot in the power to weight ratio stakes doesn't it yeah um, the car in any trim whatsoever with fuel or without fuel must weigh 700 kilos minimum um, so if you're under 700 kilos you, there is a penalty on race day so you know we we try and get the car 700 kilos dry of fuel and give ourselves a couple of kilos of tyre wear brakes and stuff like that after a race so that is that is the ruling on the weight now obviously without getting too technical where you have the weight is also quite important and it's also subject to regulation by the rule book as well isn't it it is obviously in an ideal world you want the weight on the floor but there is a rule in our formula where you can only have a maximum of 20 kilos of ballast um, so you know you can have too much ballast and you've got you've got to try and hide it but you know we we don't run that nowhere near like that we're probably running 10 to 15 kilos in both cars um, because of panels, obviously that rule went up where you've got to be a lot thicker panels now for strength and stuff like that because the panels were getting too thin, um, which was causing the damage look a lot worse than what it actually was. But obviously, it, given the choice, once again on, a, on an over where you're always turning right, you would prefer to have most of your weight percentage on the right-hand side of the car, wouldn't you? You would. Um, uh, you know, a long time ago, probably two, well, two years ago, there was a maximum side weight, um, obviously, is percentage-wise, you could have 55.5 inside weight, which obviously 55.5% of the weight on the inside wheels is a maximum you could have. But that rule has been brought down to 54%. So we've had to take you know weight out of the inside of the car and move it towards the centre or maybe to the outside. And there was a rear weight brought in as well at the same time with a maximum of 45% rear weight. So a lot of people were running over of that rear percentage. So obviously the weight has had to be moved forward and over to the passenger side to counteract the rules. Why would you want to have more weight on the rear of the car? 
for for grip really off the corner when you're going in the corner and you're turning and you want to get back on the power you, you know it's nice to have that static weight at the back of the car to try and give instant grip um, but obviously rules are rules we're all in the same boat so the rules the rule um, okay mate if you if you if you wouldn't mind uh, opening the door and let us have a look inside because unlike a stock car you can in fact open the door on one of these okay no problem Now that's uh, that's a fairly Spartan-looking seat. Presumably, it's cu custom built for racing. Is that one actually custom built for you? Uh, no, that's just an off-the-shelf Corbo Revolution seat with ears on. Um, it's a nice, comfortable seat. There's other seats available, like the NASCAR full restraints seat systems you see, with the he head restraints and stuff like that. Um, but I do prefer a bit of padding around me rather than just bare aluminium. Mm, I could see why that might be the case, yeah. especially over a long race. Yeah. And the dashboard actually looks quite sophisticated nowadays compared to the good old days where we had like a rev counter, an oil pressure gauge and a water temperature gauge and that was your lot. That, that, that seems to be not the case. Yeah, that's a, that's a digital stack, uh, the dashboard. It still does the same as your ordinary analogue auto meter, rev counter, water temperature, oil pressure, mm -hmm. but it's just digital, just for looks really, don't make you go any faster. Can you tell us something about the uh, the gear shift and the gearbox in it? Um, I can see see the gear lever sticking out of it, and obviously it's a manual gearbox, but how many gears do you actually have? Um, in the gearbox, it's an elite uh, three-speed gearbox, so we've got one first gear and we've got two second gears, if you like, uh, and a reverse. So. I don't change the diff, which is in the back axle. I will change the gears in the gearbox. We've got two drop gears. Um, so I change those gears for track to track for different sizes, which is, I find a lot easier and cheaper rather than having two or three diffs built up on the shelf, which a, a diff will cost you sort of five, six hundred pounds these days with a crown wheel and pinion and a slipper unit. So I find, you know, having the drop gears is definitely the cheaper option. Now, there are going to be people who are going to say, well, even my road car's got five gears. How come you use so few? Um, it's obviously when we get going we pull away in first in second and then with the elite gearbox you can split the gears so if I want a hundred revs split between second and third so if I get a clear track if I'm in clear track I can always go up a gear so I'm, the engine's not under so much stress under strain and the tyres or if I'm in traffic I can go down to second and I will pull down a few more revs because obviously I'm getting slowed up in traffic. But basically what it comes down to is you don't need any more because the track isn't long enough for you to build up to, say, a fourth gear or something like that. No, obviously we gear it so we don't pull above eight because we've got the rev limiter. So we try and gear it so it don't quite hit the rev limiter. Um, but obviously track condition can change from meeting to meeting. So we might find we're quicker at one meter than the other. But obviously we have to deal with that with the gearing. Yeah, now a lot of drivers still change diffs, I know. But, you, but you've obviously decided that that's a labour saving device. You, you don't need to do that now. Yeah, no, I've got a good you know, bunch of lads that help me now, so we've all got our own jobs. We can all do each other's jobs as well, which is a lot easier. So we take it in turns, and yeah, it's a lot easier way to do it. There's obviously quite a lot of metal inside this car. I, mean, I can see that from here. Um, now, I realise that a lot of this is just simply for protection because back in the 60s they had a rollover bar, then they moved to a roll cage, but this is even one step on from that. This is actually an integral part of the space frame chassis that this car is built on, isn't it? Yeah, um, space frame cars probably started in the 90s. Um, before that they were just a tin car with a roll cage in, but the r rules have become more and more intense for safety, driver safety. Two or three years ago we, was, we only had to have two uh, chicken bars, driver bars, but two years ago we had to have a third one put in and another one in the passenger side they're just trying to make it more and more safer for the drivers um, even down to a thicker floor we have to have a thicker floor now in the in the driver's side just to protect anything coming through the car yeah obviously if it went over and you got rammed from underneath that wouldn't be too clever if the floor was thin and presumably that the roof is similarly protected by sort of armor plate or something uh, it's not got armor plate but it's got good cross bracing in the roof as well which obviously is covered up by the fiberglass bodywork um, they are a real safe car yeah definitely yeah well it would need to be because obviously if you roll over and the traffic's coming towards you you don't want to be sitting there thinking oh they're going to cave the roof in on my head do you that's the last thing you want anyway you want to go to work on a monday morning at the end of the day it is still a hobby and we do it for fun so you've still got to go to work on monday <laughs> So now we're, uh, we're standing underneath the car and uh, under here it's much more obvious about the space frame construction, isn't it? You can see all the steel bars and all of that. Yeah, um, as you can see it's not very, it's scratched under the driver's side where we run it so low 
Um, but we have got a minimum ride height rule. But the chassis, yeah, there's a lot of tubing, an awful lot of tubing on them. Um, and, the, you know, it is a strong car. I noticed that the floor is completely flat. Is it any advantage to that, or is it just for simplicity's sake? Um, obviously, we've got to have a floor. It does stay in the rule books. I mean, some do run under trays, uh, full under trays, which means the, the bottom of the car is completely flat, like an F1 car. Mm -hmm. um, but I chose not to run an under tray because I think it does build up too much heat under the car. Um, and if you do get hit from the back, it does wreck the under tray, which again causes more work and more money. Well, obviously, there could be a small aerodynamic advantage in having a completely flat bottom. Yeah, I think you know there, there is, 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 is you know pluses on one and minus on the other. It, 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 I reckon on a big track, it probably does make a bit of a difference. Um, but yeah, we just see how we go. Now I can see some very large brakes underneath here. Um, presumably, they are, and and also the calipers. The calipers are enormous. Um, these are obviously a cut above your standard road going stuff. Yeah, we're on a f we run a four pot, which means you've got four pistons in a caliper, two pistons either side pushing the brake pad into the disc. Uh, they're vented discs that most road cars do have, um, and the rear brakes is the same. It's on a four pot brake caliper with vented disc as well. Yeah, no drums in the back. I noticed. Um, you're also you're not allowed to use carbon fibre or clever exotic materials like that in the brakes, are you? No, no. We we can run any any material uh, bar on carbon just for cost. I think basically that's what the rule in states. Um, but there's a lot of different pad materials there is on the market. Whether you want the brakes to be to be good at the at the start, but obviously you will then get pedal fade, or you know it's just about getting the right pad material for the certain driver. Yeah, and uh, there's also a, a very serious looking shock absorber there, or what we might call a coil over shock unit. Um, I take it they're quite a pricey item as well and presumably fully adjustable. Yeah, um, you know, there's a lot of shockers out there that we can use. Um, I, I'll run Olean's and Coney's, I, I differ from different tracks to tracks, um, but there's obviously Penske's out there. Um, but there is a, a price limit at £500 each a unit. Um, which the Olean and Penske is right on the price limit. So, I th you know, it's just to stop people spending thousands and thousands of pounds on suspension. Yeah, and obviously you're not allowed to have stuff that's adjustable from inside the cockpit of the car anymore either, are you? No, uh, you know, some people did have adjustable anti-roll bars, uh, shocker settings and stuff like that. But, you know, you can, you, know, you can only adjust it on the car, on the shocker per corner. So it just keeps things, you know, cheaper as well for, for the drivers to want to do it. Now you mentioned anti-roll bars, do you run any anti-roll bars, front, rear or at all? Uh, I did do, but I've, we've obviously gone away from that um, and we, we're just doing our own thing at the moment. But some people do run roll bars, some people think you do need roll bars, but everyone's got their own opinions and different setup advices and stuff like that. So, sure. you, you know, some people do get their cars set by different people, um, but we do our own. Now presumably the steering is also far from being what you would get on your standard road going shopping car. Yeah, we've we've got what you call a quick rack. Um, so you know, lock to lock is around one and three quarter to two complete turns of the steering wheel, which is probably twice as quick as what your road car would be. Um, but your road car would have power steering where we don't have power steering. Um, but the steering, you know, it can be heavy, but depending on suspension and setup and geometry, it, you know, you can make it lighter. Yeah, we don't want to get into things like kingpin inclination or all that because I know that has a big effect on the on the uh, on the weight of the steering. And I, I have actually seen the odd car with power in it, but it certainly isn't common anymore, is it? No, obviously it's either electric, which obviously you know we don't run alternators, uh, so the battery doesn't charge itself during the meeting, um, which we have to charge it every meeting. So you know to run power steering, you probably would need an alternator to keep the battery topped up, otherwise the power steering would fail. But now coming down to the back end of the car, Matt, um, th this this is the rear axle. Obviously these cars are rear wheel drive, which is also quite unusual in this day and age, isn't it? Yeah, um, the, the the axle centre itself is based on an Escort or a Capri for Capri. Um, some people run Capri axle, um, some Escort. The Escort is a narrower axle than the Capri. Um, a few people do make them off the shelf, uh, but you know, again, we make our own axles to suit what we require. It's really old-fashioned technology, in fact, but still does the job, because of course a, a standard Ford Escort axle was no way in the world was that intended to take kind of getting on for 200 horsepower, was it? Definitely not. I just hate to think how many people have thrown them away over the years. If you'd have said 15, 20 years ago we was going to be using Escort or Capri axles, I think we'd have probably laughed. 
Yeah, and, and the drive shafts too. Uh, that's that they're still more or less the same thing, aren't they? They are. Um, you know, there is people still running standard shafts, but there are uprated versions um, of bigger diameter half shafts because obviously the power going through the row car back in the day to what we've got going through them now, the um, the uprated half shafts do seem to be slightly stronger. Um, given that it is quite an antiquated design to have the engine at the front and the driven wheels at the rear, and most current road cars are in fact front wheel drive, why aren't front wheel drive cars used in hot rod race? Um, I think they would understeer quite severely. I know they're using other other class of formulas on the short ovals, um, but I think they would be they wouldn't handle nowhere near as good as a, a rear wheel drive car. Uh, only stuff where there's not so much horsepower involved, obviously, and and obviously I presume the rules prevent you from having four wheel drive or traction control or anything clever like that. Yeah, that's right. It's just rear wheel drive only, um, and uh, you can use different engined cars, but obviously they've still got to be front engine cars. And obviously, if you want to do a car that's different, you've got to go to the to the sanction body to get that approved first. Matt, good luck with that, and thank you very much indeed for your time today. No problem. Thank you.